This is the In Context Podcast with your host, Karen Von Hippel. It's Karen Von Hippel here, the director of RUSI, and it's a pleasure to welcome the Right Honorable the Lord Ricketts to uh, RUSI for a conversation for our In Context Podcast. Welcome. Hi, Karen. Good to be here. <laughs> So uh, you are a former British diplomat and have served in a number, a very fascinating range of positions across the spectrum, really. Uh, I think probably your most senior positions were permanent undersecretary of state, which means head of the foreign office. And uh, from 2006 to 2010, then you were the first national security advisor, which we will talk about in a bit from 2010 to 2011, and then ambassador to France, Her Majesty's ambassador to France from 2012 to 2016. You're currently a crossbench peer in the House of Lords, and most importantly, a distinguished fellow at Russie. And delighted to be so. (laughs) So welcome. So when we were doing our research about you, we didn't find too much about your childhood or uh, let's just say school era. Is there anything of interest to share with our listeners? No, I was a very normal child. The first foreign policy event I remember was the Prague Spring. Oh, wow. Um, I guess I was 16. And uh, I was so moved by the courage of the students that I picked up my pen and wrote to Daily Mail. And they wanted to put my letter at the top of their letter page. Mm -hmm. And so they rang my parents, who I hadn't told, Mm -hmm. and said, we're going to publish your son's letter. It was a panic in the family. (laughs) Um, And so it it ran with a headline, uh, Would a Loudmouth Stop a Tank? Uh, I thought all these loud mouths that I read about in the British newspapers wouldn't have had the courage of the Prague Spring. So that was my sort of political awakening, really. How fascinating. And um, I've always been interested in foreign affairs, international mm. things ever since. And what, what did your parents do? Uh, my dad in? was in the metal industry in the mm-hmm. Midlands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I went to the local grammar school. Uh, my mum was an assistant in the physics lab at the school mm-hmm. I went to. Uh, and I went from there to Oxford. Um, in those days, you got grants to do that, so my parents never really had to pay a penny for right. my education. Right. Actually, when I was at Oxford in in eighty seven, eighty eight, uh, that was basically the beginning of the turning point. So my British friends were all getting not only uh, their university paid for, but they were getting basically a bursary, right? Yeah, to, we got. I yeah. mean, it wasn't lavish, but it was enough yeah. to live on yeah. without your parents having to be rich to send you there. Right. And, and yet all my friends seemed to have an overdraft as well. I think too much time at the pub. That was standard Oxford practice. <laughs> uh, which I was really surprised about as an American. You know, you don't borrow money from the government like that, you know, it's just or borrow money from your bank or whatever. It just seemed sort of appalling to be in debt. Yeah. to me at the time, but maybe it's changed. So you joined the Foreign Office straight after university, is that correct? Correct, yeah. I was still 21 when I joined the Foreign Office. New recruit, yes. Uh, and why did you go into the Foreign Office? Did you think about other things or you just thought, this is what I want to do? I got alarmed in my last year at university when my friends started to get jobs and I hadn't really thought much about it. And so I thought I'd better start applying <laughs> for a job as well. And because I had this interest in international things, I applied to the Foreign Office and I applied to the BBC uh-huh. for a news traineeship. And actually, extraordinarily, I got an offer from both. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I tossed a coin. I went to see my tutor at college and ask him. And he said, well, I think perhaps the Foreign Office would be a bit more structure in your career. And so I did really drift into the Foreign Office mm-hmm. on the back of um, a love of abroad and um, the idea of a life um, traveling and living in other countries. And I didn't give it much more thought than that. And did you have any languages at that point? Uh, French sort of fairly rudimentary French, Mm -hmm. which got better over my career. Mm -hmm. And going to Paris was always an absolute uh, thrill Mm -hmm. Uh, in the days when it used to be the boat train to escape from London and go to Paris as as an adolescent, a teenager. uh, In college, you scraped together a few pounds and just went to Paris for a few days. uh, And that gave me such a thrill Mm -hmm. um, that I was always passionate about something to do with abroad. And the Foreign Office seemed like a good idea. Mm -hmm. And so I drifted in. Huh. And then your first job was in New York, uh, working at the UK mission to the United Nations. Uh, and that was in 74. Um, so that was sort of in the, really the height of the Cold War, right? Or Yeah, maybe- it was height of the Cold War. I mean, we had this wonderful scheme, and we still do, I think, where young new recruits to the Foreign Office, some of them are parceled off to reinforce the UN delegation in New York mm-hmm. for the busy time of the National of the uh, General Assembly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had three months, three of us went, three months in downtown Manhattan, living in a hotel, 
Mm. Having just been a student at college, it was just like wow, a dream yeah. come true. Right. Uh, and uh, you forgot about your day job. The year of Arafat and the Kalashnikov and the olive branch. Uh, so Palestine was a big issue. Yep. Uh, many other things as well. Absolutely cold war, as you say. A fascinating, life-enhancing, horizon-expanding opportunity to go and be a, a grown-up for the first time in one's life. And did you work very hard and play very hard or more one than the other? I mean, New York is such a 24-hour city. It is. I mean, we, because we were youngsters and new, we tried to do the best we could. We didn't really have a clue what we were doing. <laughs> and the more experienced diplomats would occasionally chase us out of the office and say, go home, you know, go have some fun. But we were basically uh, cannon fodder, as it were, to sit in the General Assembly to listen to 85 speeches in the general debate on X, Y, or Z. And take um, notes? Or? And take notes uh -huh. and then write, you know, a long telegram, which would then be cut down to about um, a fifth of its length by the, by the people and This was knew. all, I mean, what, we used typewriters back then, I presume, right? Typewriters back then we were using. Uh, yes, yes, or dictating, uh -huh. um, uh, writing them out and then giving them, giving uh, handwritten drafts to long-suffering secretaries. <laughs> and gradually beginning to learn the art of dictating, yeah. which in my generation, people still did. Mm -hmm. And eventually I mastered it. Well, now we do it with our phone, you see. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I mean, actually, quite, it's still quite Siri a likes, skill. Uh, yeah. Uh, Siri's our long-suffering <laughs> secretary right now. It was a fascinating uh, introduction to all sorts of things. And we would be given sort of contingency briefs on what to say mm -hmm. if uh, the Spaniards raised Gibraltar. And what uh, were you supposed something. to say? Do well, you we were, you know, the... the um, uh, new entrance, we sat there petrified that we might suddenly have to take the floor and have a right of reply to somebody who'd, you know, um, sounded off against some British interest. I don't think it ever happened to me, but it was great fun. You don't remember what your response was supposed to be? Uh, I think it was very boilerplate, but uh -huh. I mean, just the idea of having talking points and having to stand yeah. up in the General uh -huh. Assembly, you know, late one evening, yeah. if someone had launched an attack on British policy was horrifying. Uh -huh. I never actually happened. Yeah, how interesting. Uh, and then you went to Singapore for a couple of years. So that was your first longer post then, right? You were in New York for just about a yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh -huh. we did a year, I did even less than that. We did a, a first year with a bit of New York and then time back on the desk in the Foreign Office, mm -hmm. in my case, Southern Africa, hmm. and then first postings, yes. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you had no say at all as to where you were going to go. You got a letter from the hmm. personnel department. I remember one circular from the personnel department which had a quotation from Isaiah at the top. And when you look that up in the Bible, it said something like, and the Lord said, go, and he went. And the Lord <laughs> said, come back, and he came back. And that was essentially what postings policy in the Foreign Office was. I had the enormous chance of being sent to Singapore. Uh -huh. So at the age of 22, as a young diplomat, I was the dog's body in the High Commission there, doing everything. Fascinating. Internal policy, foreign policy, learning to be a diplomat. Yeah and also discovering Southeast Asia. Yeah, no, and, and you and I spent some time in Taiwan this past year, and yeah. I remember you speaking a lot about that time in Singapore, how formative it was for you. It was extraordinary. It was just after the end of the Vietnam War, and so the whole of Southeast Asia was full of rather sort of tough people uh, milling around, journalists, for ex-military, ex-diplomats, and so on, with lots of hair-raising stories of Vietnam still being exchanged. Wow. And oh, yes, uh, it was just about the year uh, that the British pulled out of their naval base in Singapore. Uh -huh. So it now seems long, long time ago. Yeah. <clears throat> but as a formative experience for a young diplomat, wonderful. And of course, now this country is thinking about doing more in that part of the world too, right? And it's one of the ironies that we were closing bases uh, in the first time part of my time in the Foreign Office. We closed the Simonstown naval base in South Africa when I was on the desk there in 74. We closed the Singapore uh, naval base in 75. We were pulling back. Now, a whole career later, mm -hmm. um, people are talking about reopening bases. Yeah. I personally, I think it's rather a good idea that yeah. Britain should come back to Asia. Yeah, and exactly. that should be one of the effects of Brexit, that we have a bit more time and bandwidth for Asia. Right, right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, then to NATO, again, still in the height of the Cold War. Now, what was happening 78 to 81 yes. on the NATO? You were in Brussels. Uh, what was happening? Again, this was the chance of a foreign office posting. I was mm -hmm. plucked out from yeah. Singapore and sent to NATO Brussels mm -hmm. in, in 1978. Uh, totally different world. And I was thrown into, obviously, the Cold War and into arms control. Mm -hmm. I was the junior on the delegation dealing with the MBFR negotiations, now not much remembered, mutual and balanced force reductions. Wow. It was the block-to-block -block negotiation between the Warsaw Pact and NATO to try and put limits on both sides' forces in Europe. It had been an idea uh, that I think Kissinger and Nixon had come up with as a quid pro quo for accepting the Soviet idea 
of a conference on security and cooperation in Europe, right. the CSC. And so we got locked into this endless negotiation of MBFR, which never in the end concluded, but which built a whole universe of principles and ideas and so on, which never in the end got applied. But I spent three years in the um, trenches of the NATO Cold War. Right. Uh, and in, in addition to doing MBFR, I was then very much involved with the uh, the INF negotiations, yeah. the, the crisis over the SS-20s, which erupted in 77, 78, uh, when the uh, Soviets deployed these mobile nuclear-tipped missiles, right. upsetting the balance, panic in Europe, um, American leadership in the response. And in the end, in 1979, what they call the dual-track decision, when defense and foreign ministers got together and they decided both that they would deploy U.S. Mm -hmm. missiles to and Europe. at the same time challenge the Soviets to take out the whole class of missile. Right. And that was a very dramatic time right. in NATO where it felt like we were kind of at the epicenter of European security and with strong American leadership. So what do you think about, uh, just to jump ahead on this one, about the U.S. decision to suspend uh, it's, uh, the, the INF Treaty with, with, this, with the Russians? Now the Russians have pulled out. Yeah. And China, of course, is not part of it. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, are you worried? I mean, it, it shows the treaty's age that it really only concerned NATO Europe, mm -hmm. and the US and Russia. It didn't mm -hmm. make provision for other countries mm -hmm. to have these missiles. And so it's got out of date. Mm -hmm. I'm personally sad because I think it was a stabilizing measure at the time. It did uh, prevent uh, a whole proliferation of missiles in that very threatening medium medium scale range. Um, now that it looks like it's finished, um, rather than trying to improve it or reform it, Americans have uh, suspended and the and the Russians pulled out. I guess it's over. I think you don't go back to Although to with Trump there. you never really know. He likes to push very hard as part of his negotiating style. I think we've all seen that's how he makes his deals, but I'm not sure it works it not the sure it way works. he wants it to work. No, I mean, I think you know, if the Russians are doing what everyone alleges they're doing, and I have no reason to doubt that, yeah. then I don't suppose that they will want to come back into it either. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think basically it's over. But it shows the cycle of history, really, that yeah. um, uh, this was 40 years ago, a really important pillar of, yeah. of European security. Now it's discarded as overtaken and redundant. And I think that's in a way a shame because once you're once you're out of, a, of mm -hmm. a, something as complex as an arms control, deal, you, you don't get back into it. Well, the concern is, of course, more about New START and that coming up in 2021. And it seems that Bolton would be quite happy to get the U.S. out of that. So hopefully by then, maybe things will have changed enough that the Americans will take this more seriously. Maybe. And I think that I think the period that I lived in NATO has some lessons for this, mm -hmm. because that was the time when people recognized that you can't just go on piling up numbers of these very, very dangerous weapons and that both sides had a mutual interest in right. putting caps on them, restraints right. on them, more transparency and so on. They were hard fought and long negotiated things. And they did bring a degree of stability. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're moving back to a world where anything goes yeah. and there are no limits on what anybody can do, that's probably a more dangerous world. Right, especially because it's more multipolar, as you were saying, than it was. <clears throat> exactly. It's more complicated, then. obviously, than it was in those days. But the wisdom of those days still counts for something in my right. mind. So I, I suppose your next posting just was to demonstrate that uh, the world was incredibly complicated back then as it is today, because you then went off to work on the Arab-Israeli desk in, in, the, in the foreign office after dealing with some of those issues in New York, right? Yeah. I mean, this was a typical rhythm of a foreign office career, uh -huh. two jobs abroad, and then back to the, yeah. back to the salt mines, as we sometimes call it, yes. of um, a desk job in London, um, always busy. Uh, in my time, uh, we had the... Um, Israeli intervention in southern Lebanon, right. the Sabra and Shatila massacre, right. um, the Israeli withdrawal from Sinai, mm -hmm. a great deal of diplomacy going on, uh, dangerous times, and another great learning curve for me because it's hard for a diplomat to, you know, to be effective without really understanding something about right. the the complex Middle East crises. Right. Well, it was, in, yeah. Uh, but then, of course, you you might have had a more of a bird's eye view because you were plucked to work for Sir Geoffrey Howe, right, during that period as his assistant private secretary. Is that correct? How many were, how many were in that front uh, office? It was a wonderful opportunity. Um, in the foreign secretary's office, there were then, and it still is now, um, a, a more senior person, mm -hmm. at councillor level, and two more junior people. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Who split the world between them. Yeah. So I suddenly became Geoffrey Howe's private secretary for the Middle East, 
um, the Far East, which was Hong Kong negotiations uh -huh. in full tilt at that time, mm -hmm. um, Latin America in the aftermath of the Falklands, mm -hmm. uh, and very difficult diplomacy trying to restore Britain's relations around Latin America, and various other things as well. So working for somebody of his stature mm -hmm. and calmness and wisdom mm -hmm. and scale, really, I mean, I think a very broad scale guy. Wow, it was a fantastic learning. Yeah, curve. that's such a great experience. It's so great to have that when you're young, too. Uh, I think a few of us who've been lucky enough to work for great mentors, you know, the earlier in life, I think you can do it, the better it is. Yes, for I mean, your to get learning. a helicopter view and to see how a really top flight person deals with an impossible yeah, workload. Right. Because there were other parts of Jeffrey Howe's life I didn't really get involved with so much, like arguing with Mrs. Thatcher every night about Europe <laughs> um, and you know, all that. Um, and, it, you know, it was a tremendous uh, exposure to somebody who coped with huge stress very calmly. Mm -hmm. And we traveled all the time. We went to Hong Kong three times to before signing the joint declaration with the Chinese in 1984. We traveled a lot in the Middle East. Um, it was, you know, it was an extraordinary time. Interesting, yeah. Uh, and then off to Washington, right, to work in the embassy <clears throat> in D.C. as first secretary, 86 to 89. Yes. I'm trying to think, uh, that was obviously the, towards the end of the Cold War now. Very interesting time to be in the United States, I would imagine. It was, yeah, I came back just before the Berlin Wall came down to, mm -hmm. to, to London. Oh, so okay. it was it was Reagan, Gorbachev, mm -hmm. and the extraordinary uh, risks they took and advances they made. Uh, it was also the Iran-Contra scandal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we suddenly found that the yeah, national course. security process in the U.S. had basically gone off the rails mm -hmm. uh, and had to be uh, you know, put back on them again uh, and proper order restored in, in the White House and uh, after Ollie North's um, yeah, yeah. Uh, depredations. That, right. So a lot, a lot there. And of course, everything else as well. I mean, I was one of the people dealing with foreign policy in the U.S. And <clears throat> what struck me was everything that happens in the world matters to the US and the US position on it matters enormously. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the UK, you know, there are many issues that happen where Britain doesn't have much of a role. Mm -hmm. In Washington, everything counted. Mm -hmm. And the national security people and the, and the State Department and so on were coping over the weekend, each weekend, with whatever the world crisis was and whatever yeah, part yeah. of the world it was. It's interesting because today, of course, that was the same when I was working for President Obama. But today with Donald Trump, it's very random what he chooses to focus on. I mean, he's focusing on Venezuela, but then he doesn't focus on so many other uh, very big crises or like Syria. He's just totally withdrawn. So I find it quite yes. interesting how they just seem to be picking and choosing or ad hoc. It's not clear to me, you know, they have a strategy. They came out with it last, or December, what was it? December of 2017, I guess. Uh, but they don't seem to be sticking to it. No, and in those days, I think Washington saw itself as the leader of the, you know, the rules-based order, mm -hmm. the international security structure of the time, and therefore had a responsibility, you know, if there was an Iran problem, if there was a, an India-Pakistan mm -hmm. blow up, mm -hmm. anything in the Middle East, and everywhere else, yeah. um, that it was up to America to do the brokering and to put the Secretary of State on the plane or the National Security Advisor mm -hmm. to spend all weekend working the phones to damp down a crisis. Yeah. And it was that was pretty striking for a British diplomat because mm -hmm. it meant we were reporting on absolutely everything that was going on across the administration because the American position really mattered. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, <laughs> maybe a little less clear, right? Well, now, yeah. I mean, the most interesting thing I, to me that was said last year was was in the uh, American national defense strategy that Jim Mattis presented, mm -hmm. where he said that uh, the number one national security priority for America is not terrorism anymore. Anything yeah. else, it is great power competition. Right, right. Um, I suppose it was great power competition still in the 1980s, but there was a great big dose of alliance coordination going on as well. And right. I see a bit less of that now. Right, of course. Uh, yeah, no, they, they Russia, China, but he's more interested in China, I think, than Russia, although his staff obviously are focused on that. So then you came back and became deputy head of security policy. Now, what did that mean? What did that entail at the time? NATO. Mm -hmm. um, NATO and alliance management mm -hmm. uh, in those days. And this was um, just after the Berlin Wall fell down. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was the period where we suddenly had to negotiate the uh, German unity and uh, a uni unified Germany joining NATO, mm -hmm. uh, which we did in a, in a diplomatic process that, you know, I think it was a classic of its kind, so-called two plus four process, two Germanys and the four <laughs> major powers, That's right, I forgot about that. <clears throat> which produced uh, historic agreements mm -hmm. to have, you know, unified Germany in NATO, 
And then, of course, the hand of friendship from NATO to the ex-Warsaw Pact countries extended very quickly, more quickly than the EU did, actually. The EU being a slower, more, you know, um, law, law-heavy law process mm -hmm. took some time to get to the Maastricht Treaty and enlargement. But NATO was very quick in reaching out to these new, newly independent um, ex-Warsaw Pact countries. And so NATO enlargement... Um, expansion of NATO, first in Germany and then, then other countries, was a major factor. And European defence, the idea that now this Europe freed from the mantle of the Cold War ought to be developing its own defence policy. Right. Now that's, that, that went on for two decades, right. but it got going fairly quickly after the Berlin War fell. Right. Well, that's just before the Bosnian Civil War when that whole obviously yes, conversation exactly, really mattered. Exactly. It's Europe's it power. Was, it was the. And it, it really wasn't right. It was the Iraq, first Iraq War, the, yeah. the, the Gulf War, yeah. and George Bush's uh, <clears throat> extraordinarily effective and efficient yeah. conduct of that. Um, but yes, then the emerging problems from disintegrating Yugoslavia just beginning, and Europe trying to find its place. Yeah. But then here you go back to Asia. Oh no, no, you did. Sorry, head of Hong Kong in London. I was put to be the non-sinologist uh -huh. in the China business uh -huh. because this was, I mean, I'd, I'd had some exposure to it in 1984 with uh -huh. Jeffrey Howe. Now in the mid 1990s, we were coming up to the handover of Hong Kong to mm -hmm. the Chinese in 1997. Uh, the pressures were rising. It was becoming highly political. Mm -hmm and the negotiations were very difficult with the Chinese, particularly on representative government in Hong Kong, as we called it, not, mm -hmm. not even saying democracy. And it was about the time that the government decided to replace the civil service governor, David Wilson, with the political governor, Chris Patton, because this was becoming a major political issue mm -hmm. to get through the last years of the transition in good shape. And so in addition to all the brilliant Sinologists who were the core of our structure, <clears throat> they wanted a generalist who could write the papers for ministers mm -hmm. and be the link man between Chris Patton mm -hmm. and Douglas Heard, the foreign secretary mm -hmm. and the foreign office. Mm -hmm. And so that's a role I played for two years, mm -hmm. including a long and in the end um, failed negotiation with the Chinese over this issue of democracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. It's something I've done in my career quite a lot in the Middle East and then in Hong Kong to be the generalist among experts. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's always necessary. Skill. Yeah, it's, it's necessary skill. because sometimes the experts get too in the weeds or are not able to pull back and think about other strategic I mean, you need issues. Both, really, you yeah. need both. And yeah. you need people who can, you know, relate to ministers and explain to them what this is, what's going on here, mm -hmm. what the real issues are. Uh, and with Governor Patton, of course, he wanted, you know, somebody back home who, you know, who could be his link man. Yeah. So we developed very close relations yeah, with wonderful. Patton and his team in Hong Kong. I left just before the handover to mm -hmm. China in, in 1997. And when I look back now, of course, there are pressures uh, on Hong Kong politically from China, but the economic success of Hong Kong is extraordinary. Yeah. And I think we would none of us dared hope that 15, 20 years on, Hong Kong would have prospered so well mm -hmm. uh, in this funny half and half situation, yeah. um, you know, one country, two systems. It's proved more resilient than one might have hoped, mm -hmm. even though now uh, the, it's eroding uh, yeah. and the two systems are rather less clear than they were. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, it must have been interesting as well working for Chris Patton. He's another yes. really well-respected statesman, really. He is, so and, and he brought a totally different approach to the governorship of Hong Kong. It had always been you know, a, a, a grand civil servant, very mm -hmm. effective, usually a China scholar. And here, this Westminster politician who would have been foreign secretary, I think, in uh, John Major's government if he hadn't lost his seat in Bath mm -hmm. in the general election and was therefore suddenly spare. And uh, John Major sent him out to take on this role mm -hmm. of <clears throat> Hong Kong. I mean, my anecdote is that um, when he arrived, the first thing he said to me was, I'm not going to wear that hat because governors had this um, diplomatic uniform with you know, a hat with feathers, feathers and so and on. He said, so he wouldn't wear that. <laughs> and then he said, produce me a draft of my opening speech to the Legislative Council. Mm -hmm. And so we produced him the sort of thing that a, that a foreign office governor would have said, you know, it's a great honor and a privilege to be here on behalf of Her Majesty. You know? <clears throat> it disappeared. And about two weeks later, a much longer, much more political, much more... Assertive? Yes. Um, you know, a more colorful, mm -hmm. more impactful, mm -hmm. more dynamic speech came back, talking about Hong Kong uh, uh, as, you know, the shining city on the hill and so on. And we suddenly thought, ah, we're dealing with a different... Sort of and he yeah. didn't have to get permission from John Major to do that. 
No, I mean, John Major gave him a very uh -huh. large great, degree of discretion to, yeah. to, you know, to go out and put some democratic backbone into Hong mm. Kong before mm. the handover mm. to China. And Chris Patton um, went at that with gusto. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, then he went on to be a European Union commissioner. I can't remember which commissioner he was. Um, trade. Trade. But from uh, my recollection, he was the most popular commissioner in Brussels at the, for, at the time anyway. He was yeah. just I mean, he's really widely regarded by everybody. Brilliant, funny, good with people, mm -hmm. sharp, mm -hmm. um, uh, with a great sense of sort of uh, you know, public service and duty. And he brought that talent to the commission as well right. and worked very hard at it. Yes. And now he's Chancellor of Oxford <coughs> University. Indeed he is. Bringing um, those same skills to absolutely Oxford. Absolutely. Yeah, fascinating. It, so then you finally get your dream job in the mid-90s. You go to Paris as the economic and financial counselor. And how was your French at this stage? Uh, my French was reasonable and quickly got a lot better while I was there. Mm -hmm. I'd never quite lost it. And yes, it was. this was uh, an opportunity to go and be um, the representative of the Treasury and the Bank of England in mm -hmm. Paris, which perhaps rather surprised the Treasury and the Bank of England. And I had to go and do some rapid training courses in, in basic economics and so on. Mm -hmm. um, LSE provided an extremely good six-week run in to, uh, uh, for somebody who'd never done economics before. <laughs> and so I went and, and uh, studied the differences, really, between the French economy, which in those days was still very, very regulated, high unemployment, high mm -hmm. welfare pay, high tax. Lots of strikes. A lot of strikes. <laughs> and then the British economy, which was in its deregulation, supply side opening up phase and big, big differences between the two. Mm -hmm. And a lot of interest in France, actually, in how the British experiment was working. Mm, interesting. As, you know, after Thatcher and how that was all washing through. It was a period of, of optimism and growth in Britain uh, and anxiety in France, the winter of discontent they had there, a lot of public sector strikes in 1995 and so on. But it was a chance to get to know France much more deeply. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, embed my love of France, which has mm -hmm. always been with me. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. And then you came back and you were deputy political director and then director of international security at the Foreign Office. So now what did that, these are sort of vague terms, what did that entail? The deputy political director was basically the point man on the Balkans war. Mm. Um, the political director in the Foreign Office is effectively the number two civil servant in the Foreign Office, covers a very large area, any, mm -hmm. any foreign policy problem is covered by the political director. And he had a number of deputies working to him, a director for the Middle East, a director for the uh, Far East, etc. cetera. And uh, the job I had, which was basically Balkans. Yeah. So I came in towards the end of the Bosnia war and I lived the Kosovo war. Yeah, 99, 2000, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I was the point man through all that difficult time when Milosevic began all over again yeah. to send his troops this time into, into Kosovo, um, harass people, drive Kosovo Albanians out, right. the awful migrations that we had. Rambouillet um, was around that time, wasn't uh, it? We had the yeah. Rambouillet conference. Yeah. I was one of the British delegates mm -hmm. there. That was a last ditch effort to try and get the Serbs and the Kosovars together and negotiate peace. Mm -hmm. Failed um, NATO air campaign uh, and eventually uh, Milosevic pulling out and then the K4 force being deployed. Right. And that's when I was <coughs> deployed, basically. I lived there for about a year during okay. that time. Well, yeah. I, I, I lived all that from London. Yeah. Very intense time. Yeah. Uh, that was a time when the Europeans were pressing to get the Americans involved. And Blair and Clint Blair and Chirac were frustrated that Bill Clinton took so long yeah. to understand we're going to another, need another ground force after Bosnia. And they had to drag him to it, really. And when that happened, then K4, as you know, was able fairly quickly to damp down yeah. uh, the immediate tensions uh, and, of course, the, uh, the follow-on uh, operation. Well, um, but they didn't do, none of us did a good uh, job anticipating that the Albanians would take revenge on the Serbs the way that they did, of course. So I spent my time there in 2000 working basically with the Serbs to try to come up with ways of protecting them because none of us had anticipated that. But but it was yes. interesting. So Sergio de Mello was the first SRSG, the late, now late Sergio de Mello, who was tragically killed in, in Iraq in uh, 2003, I think. Yes. Uh, but then, of course, the French managed to put Bernard Kushner, the very dynamic at the time, health secretary, or was he a foreign secretary? No, he was foreign secretary later, wasn't he? He was foreign secretary later in France, yeah. yes. He was a great boss. And in fact, uh, I was just thinking uh, when we were talking earlier about the new, about the UN, uh, I went with him once to the Security Council and we 
sat in one of those rooms where he was briefing all the ambassadors. And he was so sort of charismatic as he is that if you looked into the translation booths, the translators were just laughing their heads off and just enjoying it so Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Just slightly amusing, yeah. But he was a, he was a very good... The, the Balkans did produce some really great Western yeah, leaders, didn't yeah. they? I'm thinking of Paddy Ashdown, poor Paddy, who Paddy, just died right, recently right. in Bosnia. Right. Who they put their heart and soul right. into trying to bring peace and stability right. to these areas. On, on the military side as well, I mean, General Jackson, uh, there were some other generals in charge who did a, yeah. a very good job. I mean, they, we really, really put our shoulders to the yeah. wheel in both Bosnia and Kosovo. It was it was absolutely the best of Europe. And I That's hope what history I will decide that it was worth doing. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think it was, you know, when you look back now after Iraq and Afghanistan, you forget that we did have some successes yeah. in mean, the nation building experience back these then. These things take time, yeah. Karen, don't they? I mean, 20 years on, we can begin to say that they're on the road now right. to membership of EU, right. potentially membership of NATO. Some you know, some right. countries are. And you know, the, the history will look back and say, actually, that was worth it. Right. May but not I, have felt like it at the time. Right. But I also feel that uh, <coughs> unlike in Iraq, we went into those areas with potentially more humility, whereas I think there was too much hubris yeah. in the Iraq experiment, and they ignored the lessons and the experience of people who had worked in the Balkans. And that was one of the frustrations I think many of us who followed that found with what really the American-led intervention and the really the enormous mistakes made in the post, yes. post-military <clears throat> period. I mean, they are very different cultures, aren't they? At least in the Balkans, the cultures were not so different. And it's remarkable to remember as well that Western forces had almost no casualties yeah, right. in Bosnia and Kosovo. Right. You know, we didn't fight a ground right. war. We, we didn't put create... the ground forces in after right. the airstrikes and, and when there was a degree of sort of grudging uh, stability restored. Right. We were not targets. No, you're absolutely right. But I think it was also the mistakes in Iraq, again, that made the U.S. the targets, dismantling the entire Iraqi army, you know, created an insurgency. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, targeting Westerners. You're right. We just, you know, I could go anywhere really in Kosovo. I never worried about someone. No. I was more worried about a car crash because everyone drove like maniacs. We there. weren't the problem. <laughs> right. We were Whereas not the problem. We became the problem in Iraq and indeed in right. Afghanistan. Right. Right. Then in 2000, 2001, you came back to be chairman of the the JIC, the Joint Intelligence Committee at the Cabinet Office. And that's always an interesting position. Yes. So tell us a bit about that role. Yes. I mean, that was classically um, a role taken by a foreign office person, although now it's been taken by others since my time. Right. Um, you are chairman of one of the most senior committees in Whitehall, and it's where the heads of the intelligence agencies and the permanent secretaries, the, the top officials from you know, Foreign Office, Home Office, Ministry of Defence, mm -hmm. get together. Um, and in the British system, we've always tried to maintain the line that the intelligence agencies collect their intelligence, mm -hmm. but they don't do their own assessment. Right. Because if you leave them to mark their own homework, they will all say they've got the crown jewels. Right? Right. And therefore, we've had a single central intelligence assessment unit where all the material is put in and uh, it's uh, agreed as a cross Whitehall assessment. That's what the JIC do. It's meant that they've tried to keep perspective and not have one intelligence agency uh, compete with another for the ear of ministers, mm -hmm. which is what rather happens in Washington, where you have a lot of competitive assessment done by different agencies. Well, yeah, although I think nine, after 9-11, they tried to allow uh, disagreements to rise to the top because yeah. they were slightly worried about everyone agreeing too early on without hearing dissenting voices. So how did you manage that? Yes. Um, I mean, I don't think you get that problem in Washington where there's, there's a cacophony of different intelligence assessments going up the line. Uh, here, yes, one of the criticisms of the JIC was that it produced a homogenized product. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, the risk was you ironed out differences mm -hmm. rather than um, exposed them to ministers. On the other hand, we always thought in the JIC that it's not much use sending to the Prime Minister on a sort of Friday evening a paper which says, you know, well, it might be this, mm -hmm. the missile might have this range or it might have that range, <laughs> you know, or this country might attack or it might not. Mm -hmm. You know, disagreements like that don't help really because mm -hmm. ministers can't work out what the right answer is. So we tended to try to expose our judgments and say, you know, we can't be sure, but, mm -hmm. you know, all the evidence points to this or on balance our judgment is that. Um, so that where we were not <clears throat> all that clear. At least we were honest about that. And uh, as in any intelligence assessment, you can get things wrong. But I think it did give in quite short papers mm -hmm. um, some very complex subjects, reduce them to 
uh, three or four pages which a minister could quickly read over the mm -hmm. weekend and, and get a sense of it. We were always a little bit to one side of the policy process. And when we come to talk about the NSC, um, we can we can look there at the, the real boost that is given to the mm -hmm. JIC mm -hmm. because it gives them direct access to the customer right. in a way that we didn't have when I was um, chairman of the JIC. Because, of course, then you became political director at the Foreign Office in the run-up to the Iraq War of 2001 to 2003, uh, I guess. So the beginning was 9-11, and then you end with the Iraq War. It's not a Correct. not a pleasant bunch of not pleasant bookends. <clears throat> it was it was quite a quite an interesting time. I arrived back in this role as political director, which is responsible for basically the foreign policy advice across the whole Foreign Office, one week before 9-11. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> that blotted out the landscape for nine months or a year where we tried to get um, the most coordinated international reaction mm -hmm. to that devastating attack in New York. Um, and then very quickly up on the rails came the increasing tensions over Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my case, uh, an enormous effort on successive UN Security Council resolutions. Mm -hmm. um, I became the kind of negotiator in the Foreign Office for 1661, which was the the uh, big resolution uh, that did get adopted and then the, all the efforts to have a second resolution which in the end failed uh, and then we went into the war and through through the Iraq war yeah so it was a time when um, Jack Straw was my foreign secretary uh -huh. and Jack and I absolutely lived very very intensively all that period right uh, and all the problems that came with Right. I mean, uh, and if we can <coughs> remind our listeners that uh, after 9-11, this was the first and only time NATO invoked Article 5 in support of the United States. And it's sort of rich when President Trump is now threatening to withdraw from NATO, that the only time it's ever been invoked was in support of the United States. It was the, uh, the day after 9-11. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. done so fast. Uh, and it was a real show of solidarity and support uh, from NATO. Of course, it was followed then by the decision to go into Afghanistan. Right. And all the troop contributing um, countries joining and, in. Right? Uh, all, basically all NATO members right. went in in solidarity with the US as well, and which mm -hmm. turned out to be a very long commitment. So yes, it was a period of mobilization really across the world behind the US. Mm -hmm. And then also mobilization with everybody crying out for more advice and support on counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. How do we all cope with our terrorist problem? Right, I remember that. And uh, an enormous effort to try and uh, get some sense into all the offers of international support and the demand for right. training and help. That also took a great deal of time right. uh, over those first nine months. Right, I remember that. Now, now you then go back to uh, NATO as the ambassador of the UK permanent representative. At this point, did you get consulted about your next job or <laughs> were you still just assigned? <laughs> just before we go back to that, I mean, maybe, mm. maybe a word on the Iraq mm. War. Mm. Um, please, please, sorry. Because Jack Straw and I did spend a great deal of the time on the multilateral aspects of mm -hmm. it, particularly the, the UN approach. Um, and uh, right up to very late on in the day, I certainly believed it was quite possible that Saddam Hussein would do enough in terms of access for the inspectors to Iraq to mean that there wouldn't be an intervention. Mm -hmm. And I still think it's an extraordinary thing that uh, Saddam Hussein, when he could see the massive forces arrayed against him, didn't do just the minimum mm -hmm. to make it impossible, yeah. certainly for Britain to have gone to war by by you know, opening the door a bit to the inspectors. I never really understood that. Mm -hmm. um, but therefore it was, it was um, uh, a war that certainly up to very late in the day, I thought was quite possible to avoid. Mm -hmm. In the yeah. end, it didn't prove it. And, and uh, uh, we've all learned a great number right. of lessons from it. Yeah, and I think we might be in a better place today <clears throat> oh, yeah, if so. we had avoided that you know, war. And, uh, you know, I think the, the germ of the idea of our National Security Council arose in the the defaults, yeah. the shortcomings in our decision making, right? The mistakes that all all of us made. Yeah. So then, so so then you go to NATO to be the UK permanent representative, and does yes. And did you have a choice in this position? Well, I yeah, I certainly had a say. <laughs> I mean, I had become extremely close to Jack Straw, of course, mm -hmm. in those days. Uh, I had to go through an appointment process, but um, because of my previous experience in NATO and the fact that all through my career, like a thread, runs crisis management, mm -hmm. war, right. political, NATO. military, NATO. It seemed like a very obvious Made move sense. for me to go and do that. Uh, and uh, it was quite a relief actually to get out of London after six pretty hard years in London, finishing up with the Iraq war, and then to go to NATO and to actually to receive the ball on the other side of the net, as it were, in tennis, <clears throat> by trying to work with NATO to heal the wounds of the mm -hmm. Iraq war, 
and arrange for NATO to take on uh, training commitments mm -hmm. in Iraq mm -hmm. and trying to get beyond the deep and bitter divisions that the war had created between NATO allies. Right. Well, in fact, NATO is now going back to Iraq to take on some of the counter ISIL uh, capacity building training for yeah. the Iraqis. Yeah. So it's quite but it was, you know, it, I think it's quite a tribute to the Allied sense of solidarity that within one, one year of the end of the war in 2004, NATO had set up a training mission in Iraq. And I think most of the allies, including France, were willing to help that, mm -hmm. which was nothing to do with the intervention. It was all to do with training you know, Iraqi forces that could, could build the future. And NATO, one way or the other, has been there mm -hmm. ever since. But you were also still <clears throat> dealing with the Balkans as well in that period. We certainly were. Yeah. We certainly were. The council used to travel together. Uh -huh. uh, great outings we did with our 27 the ambassadors and the secretary general. Uh, George Robertson at the uh -huh. beginning. Oh, and so we went to visit NATO forces, yes, in Kosovo, uh -huh. uh, in Afghanistan, uh -huh. in the back of Hercules planes, which yeah. is, uh, you know, quite an experience. Yeah. Um, and myself, wherever NATO yes. was deployed, yes, the, the council would go and visit them. So we did a certain amount of national security travel. Now, how easy was it getting consensus? Because, of course, in the, the NAC and NATO, the council, uh, you have to have consensus, don't you, before you do anything? You and do, that, was you that know. just gut-wrenching experience or it's, was it... Mind numbing, I'm trying to think of the right. <laughs> uh, it could be. Um, George Robertson, the Secretary General, used to have a saying towards the end of a table round of these 27 ambassadors, um, everything has been said, but not yet by everyone. <laughs> and that was uh, something that I certainly recognised as well. Um, there were still some very deep differences, for example, between the US and France mm -hmm. uh, over Iraq, and, and those took some time right. to heal. But NATO has always been an organization where you don't vote. Mm -hmm. um, it's a consensus organization, yes. It's not a supranational organization, so you don't make laws in NATO. It's all the political will of governments. And because of the role of America, you know, there is one ally that is out of mm -hmm. scale with all the others. Mm -hmm. It's always been a disproportionate alliance. And uh, until recently, I think everyone has respected that. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, American leadership, American cajoling, American pressure usually found a way of bringing NATO to an agreement mm -hmm. and NATO foreign ministers and then even more so NATO summits were occasions where you didn't negotiate texts, you ratified agreements and you spent the time talking about big strategic issues around the world. So a very different feeling to EU meetings. Uh, was there any discussion at that period about an EU army? Yeah, well, By the French in particular? Yes, there was. I mean, there was certainly a lot of discussion about um, uh, EU defence that really uh, we tried to capture that as the British uh, with our bilateral agreement with the French at Saint-Malo mm -hmm. in 1998, mm -hmm. which I was heavily involved with. Mm -hmm. And then all through the early 2000s, um, we were trying to build up a cap capability mm -hmm. of, of um, European forces, not a standing European army, but a, a, a European capacity to deploy forces, which would be uh, compatible with NATO, available to NATO, or available for EU operations. And the British and the French were able to find a reconciliation between our different ambitions. The French, maybe one day for a standalone European army, Britain very much for, for a collection of forces that would be compatible with NATO. And all the way through the 2000s, uh, we, we maintained that reconciliation. It never developed into anything very big or, or impressive mm -hmm. in terms of capability, but uh, EU forces have been doing useful missions around the world, usually in training or mm -hmm. peacekeeping duties. The idea of a European army was always in the background, but well in the background in those days. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the German, I uh, chaired the German defense minister at Davos, and she mentioned again, I know it's this is back on the, on the cards for a number of reasons, but she had mentioned again, but really leaning more towards British interpretation, not to replace uh, uh, NATO, but to complement or to go where NATO won't go, e.g. Mali. Yeah. That was her argument. I mean, my take on it is... Um, when the French and the Germans talk about an EU army, they mean different things, mm -hmm. really. They from each other. The French and the Germans from each, from each other. other. Yeah. yeah. The French mean, I think, European forces that can come in behind the French. When the French have taken initiative and gone to Mali yeah. or Central African Republic, right. that the Europeans should be capable of deploying a sort of second wave yeah. force. Backstop. I think in Germany, the main driver is a more efficient European defence equipment mm -hmm. process, ordering... Um, equipment in a, in a better way, harmonizing your requirements and sort of mm -hmm. making more sense of European defense industry. Uh, and only perhaps as a secondary thing, uh, actually having the deployable forces. And I think the, the um, tag of a European army is totally misleading. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're never going to have 
uh, in my view, a, a European army where the French put their troops under supranational European command and, and the Italians and others do. They will always want to have national forces, but forces that are trained to work together and, and you right. can deploy together. So I think the European army creates this sort of myth of there's going to be some sort of command structure in the EU deploying um, a single standing European army. I think that that mm-hmm. is for the birds. Mm-hmm. Right. And I suppose it leans into the, all the conversations right now about European strategic autonomy yes, as well. It does. Um, and it could have a negative effect in the sense that if, if um, <clears throat> the American administration hears talk of a European army and thinks that means the Europeans gearing up to take on their mm-hmm. own autonomous you know, defense of Europe, uh, territorial defense of Europe, then it might discourage the Americans from, from maintaining the vitality of NATO. So I think it's quite important that people understand each other, what they mean by these terms. Um, I think if it's about better European capability, why not? But if it's about replacing the Americans, I think that that's hopeless. Right, right. Uh, interesting, yeah. Okay, so interesting time at NATO. And then you came back to be the permanent undersecretary of state. So you went from being the political director to then in charge the top senior yep. civil servant at the foreign office, yep. giving advice directly to the minister of state, who at the time was? Uh, in, in my time, it was uh, Margaret Beckett when uh-huh. I got back. Uh-huh. Uh, and then David Miliband for a large part of my time. So you worked with Malcolm, our deputy, several times then, because Malcolm was with Jack Straw for a little while and then with Margaret as well. Absolutely. Yeah, interesting. Absolutely. Uh, well, tell us a bit about that job then. I mean, I'm just looking again at the year 2006 to 2010. That's a very long time. Wow. Yes, I That's did. That's a tough years. job. <laughs> it, 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 it's the top civil servant in the Foreign Office. And um, your name is not Simon. I'm very interested. I know. Yeah. No, no. It's it's become, you know, you have to be called Simon these days. Um, it's a job unlike any other in the civil service. And frankly, one that I didn't feel I was particularly trained or prepared for. Because where you spend your life in, in the foreign office doing policy, mm-hmm. suddenly when you get to be the top guy, um, you are the leader of the organization, which means you are doing a lot of communication, leadership, uh, resource managing, people managing, uh, networking with the rest of Whitehall. Um, it's a it's a more uh, managerial job mm-hmm. and a leadership job, unlike anything that I had done before. Very, very exciting and very different. If there was a frustration, it was there wasn't much time to do policy because the policy work tended to be done by people, one, one or two layers down the system, working to the minister overnight. I would see copies in my box um, and I would comment on them if I had the chance or wanted to, but I wouldn't be in the discussion so much because I would be busy sorting out the, the um, resources uh, or the postings process mm-hmm. or um, going to other meetings in Whitehall with other permanent mm-hmm. secretaries and so on. Um, important things to do, but different. Yeah. Uh, and um, I found some of that frustrating. The most um, rewarding and stimulating thing actually was the people issues, mm-hmm. I think. I think to get decisions right on choosing a person whose career is going to advance, Mm -hmm. putting the right person into the right job is Mm -hmm. the critical thing that a leader has to do in any organization. So you would sign up on all the ambassadorial and high commissioner posts? Yes. They would come to you though from... We made them, we made the ambassador post decisions in in a committee. Yep. um, And sometimes had interviews. We were Mm -hmm. increasingly, we've been using interviews in the foreign office Mm -hmm. now Mm -hmm. to open up Mm -hmm. the um, field for people, not necessarily the person who's career best fits, you know, who's a career experience best fits, but maybe, mm-hmm. you know, somebody who you hadn't thought, but, but you mm-hmm. found an interview to be a better fit. So a lot of careful weighing of different candidates for the jobs and selecting, which yeah, it wasn't just down to me, it was down to a, the senior committee we had. But the satisfaction of putting the right person in the right job and seeing them flourish and blossom, mm-hmm. you know, particularly women, mm-hmm. I made a big effort to try and bring on mm-hmm. women, mm-hmm. younger women in their foreign office. Uh, and uh, that is continuing, I'm glad to say. Uh, so that that was perhaps the most satisfying thing. Um, resource management wasn't particularly my speciality, although all perm sex have to do it. And the relationship with the foreign secretary uh, was important. Mm-hmm. But as they say, for most of the time, they were dealing quite rightly mm-hmm. with people further down the machine on each individual right. policy area. Right. They were getting the expert advice you, about you had to be issues or countries. Yeah, or, yeah. You had to accept that quite a lot of it wasn't, wasn't going right. through you. I mean, in the war, uh, Second World War, I mean, one of my heroes is Alexander Cadogan, who was mm-hmm. the permanent secretary throughout the Second World War. Everything going out of the Foreign Office to Anthony Eden or to Churchill went through Cadogan. Yeah. And he used to sit there till 1 a.m. 
you know, uh, putting his notes yeah. on things and sending them off to church or whatever. Um, that changed over time to the point where the permanent secretary has been less in the loop on policy than used to be the case. And it depends on the foreign secretary too, because some of them want to be very involved in decisions and some are happy to, de- you know, delegate a each, lot. Each right? is different. Each is different. Although in the end, foreign secretaries have to be involved in things, um, not least because of the density of that international network that whatever is happening, you tend to need your foreign secretary to be there and involved. And and now with the Brexit likely happening, uh, obviously lots of conversations. I bet that job is incredibly complicated now because it's all about what new postings and how many new people and what resources are available and, you know, opening more offices rather than closing, right? Yes, I've seen that Jeremy Hunt's been doing that. I'm sure you know, that's been a big thing. Yeah, I think effective, effectively we have to rethink British foreign policy um, and a sort of strategy for the country when we are no longer in the European Union, but outside it trying to influence from the outside, where Washington is changing, uh, where the US attitude to multilateral organizations is changing. All that changes the fundamentals of British foreign mm-hmm. policy. And we need a well-resourced foreign office, mm-hmm. confident, well-respected to define that strategy with other departments and then carry it out. And I hope that after Brexit is out of the way, however that happens, the department that was set up to deal with Brexit, called DEXU, uh, will be folded back into the Foreign Office uh, because our bilateral relations with individual European countries will be essential to us. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be run out of the Foreign Office. Mm -hmm. So we need a stronger, better resourced Foreign Office to deal with the post-Brexit world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so now we are now getting to the National Security Advisor uh, 2010, 2011. Um, so the decision was made. Uh, why to have one? I mean, do you do you remember the the genesis of this? The genesis was in the Conservative Party in opposition after the Iraq War, mm-hmm. and David Cameron became the leader in 2005. He and his um, shadow ministers, I think, decided that we had to have a better process for taking our decisions Mm -hmm. on national security and pulling Whitehall together Mm -hmm. on what was a broadening range of threats with terrorism and cyber and other things as well. And that therefore we should essentially copy the American NSC system. I mean, the NSC system in the US is much bigger, of course. I think 400 people in national security staff and is in statute, I mean, it's laid down in the 1949 Act. In the British system, it was always going to be smaller. We don't do organization of government by law. Uh, so it was, you know, it's less formal. But in opposition, the Conservatives developed a plan to have a National Security Council. And David Cameron said, I want this National Security Council to meet in my, on my first day in government. Hmm. So then they had to find a National Security Advisor. And uh, they rightly, I think, decided it would be a civil servant, not a minister. In our system, it would be incredibly disruptive and frictional to have a minister sitting right next to the prime minister in that powerful position. Mm-hmm. So they looked around for civil servants and they lighted on me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was in the you foreign the right office, background. I had the background. And so David Cameron asked me if I would come over and be his first national security then, advisor, create right. the job, create the staff and make sure on day one, there was a national security council meeting, which there was. And now it's very hard to do with, uh, uh, you know, new establishing new parts of the bureaucracies can be incredibly difficult and making sure that it's right in there, you really need the backing of the boss. So it's very good that you had the backing of the prime minister and then you just need to drive, drive, drive because otherwise so many, you know, the other bureaucratic turf wars can break out and people can try to prevent you from usurping the power that you would need to do it properly or they might see it as a threat. Although eventually I think most people realize actually this is great for us and this is how we can use the system better to get decisions made. But I think in in the beginning, there must have been a lot of pushback, right? Well, you're right. And and I think if people feel that, then it's been a success. Um, Yes, it would only work if the Prime Minister wanted it and the Prime Minister decided to use the National Security Council to actually take decisions. If the Prime Minister had set it up, but it became just a sort of decorative part of the landscape and all the decisions were taken in small rooms, you know, without consultation, then it would have failed. Mm -hmm. But David Cameron wanted it to be the place where decisions were made, Mm -hmm. where there was open debate, challenge, discussion. And he insisted that not only ministers should be there, but the heads of the intelligence agencies, uh, National Security Advisor, myself, uh, and key officials should come in to lay the groundwork for problems, explain it, and then ministers would debate and decide, which is not the way British cabinet committees have been done, Mm -hmm. really. 
uh, and we learned very quickly he, he wanted challenge he didn't want mm -hmm. you know a synthesized um, civil service paper he wanted argument disagreement mm -hmm. um, so that he could get through to the right decision and it proved to be very effective I mean it you know it took over the work of several existing cabinet committees and the staff but because it met every week and it was the Prime Minister's vehicle for taking decisions it became a powerful centre for Whitehall and I set myself up as a um, national security advisor sitting in the cabinet office which sounds like a bureaucratic detail but it meant that I wasn't just a sort of creature of the Prime Minister in the hour by hour battle in number 10 all the time I was a secretary to a committee where the Home Secretary and the Foreign Secretary and the Defence Secretary could also see me as mm -hmm. their impartial, secretary, right, impartial, right, right. giving them a, you know a balanced diet of internal and external crisis issues and longer term issues, so that the National Security Council wasn't just a crisis managing structure, which is always the risk. Right. No. No. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I spent <laughs> a lot of time doing bureaucratic reforms for the State Department and I, you know, everything matters, where you sit matters, yeah. when you meet, how you meet, all of that matters. Process really does matter, actually. The People signal don't... you send matters. Yeah, right. But obviously the support from the boss at the top matters most of all. And uh, the, David Cameron was very good at giving that. And I right. think Theresa May has continued. Right, right. No, that's absolutely the case. Okay, so we will end in a few minutes, but we want to talk about your final government job. You went back to France. Now, this must have been so exciting to go back as, as Her Majesty's ambassador. Uh, your French is fabulous at this point, so you can give speeches and uh, do all sorts of things, get to know the country very well. But you were obviously very involved in UK-French defense cooperation during that period. This is 2012 to 2016, uh, following the Lancaster House Treaties of 2010 and a number of other critical issues, right? I mean, was that yes. just an incredible experience going back? Um, it was a wonderful experience, obviously, in many ways. We have a fantastic residence mm -hmm. in Paris. French people love to come. And uh, as an ambassador, you're able to meet you know, the most interesting people in the society sure. in all sorts of walks of life. And as you say, we had in 2010, had the Lancaster House agreements with the French, British, French agreements, two treaties, one on nuclear cooperation mm -hmm. for 50 years, one on more general defense, military equipment, armed forces cooperation, really important structural treaties. And at that time, a lot of French enthusiasm for working with the British Armed Forces, mm -hmm. Britain and France being the two countries in Europe that really have um, world-class armed forces able to go and do intensive combat. So it made good sense for us to work together. Quite a lot of other national security issues came along, including, um, of course, the terrorism that France suffered so mm. awfully starting in 2013 and then with the terrible Bataclan and Stade de France attacks in mm. 2015. Right, of course. So a lot of counterterrorism cooperation. Um, and in all walks of life, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything everything that happens in Britain and France is of interest to the other country. So as ambassador, you can get drawn into you know whatever is going on in the country at that time. We had a presidential election where President Hollande won after uh, beating Sarkozy mm -hmm. uh, and a uh, change of regime, therefore, change of policy. Mm -hmm. Altogether fascinating. And as you say, I think a modern ambassador needs to have the language, the level where they can go on the equivalent of the Today programme yeah. and explain well, themselves. Yeah. And uh, that's not easy. But yeah. um, uh, luckily, having had a whole career to sort of practice for yeah. it, I, I could do that. Uh, what was? Did you learn how to uh, bake a souffle? I knew people who could, <laughs> uh, and I had the In benefit of eating kitchen. quite a lot. <laughs> um, and what was your favorite part of France? Did you visit? The, I mean, you must have been everywhere now at this stage. We tended, yeah, we tended to go to the big cities. Mm -hmm. um, I would have been, I would have preferred to go more to the countryside, as it mm -hmm. were. Uh, I have a special attachment to Normandy. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we've had a small house there for mm -hmm. many years. And uh, so that's the part of France that, that I go back to most happily. Mm -hmm. But every part of France is so different. I mean, one of the one of the great benefits France has is that, you know, they go from mountains to Mediterranean yeah. to uh, rolling agricultural land right. to wonderful Atlantic beaches, all in the same country. Wine country and champagne country. Uh, everything, everything you could <laughs> ask for. But uh, Normandy will be interesting, of course, this June because of the 75th anniversary of D-Day. So will you be there watching it from your own house? Uh, I will them. be there. Yeah. Um, indeed, I am the chairman watching of the something called the Normandy Memorial Trust, mm -hmm. uh, which is building a British national memorial mm. to all those who fell under British command wonderful. in Normandy. We haven't had that before. There's a wonderful American um, uh, memorial. There's a Canadian memorial. We're building a British memorial. It Great. won't be ready for this 
D-Day, but we're going to inaugurate it with a sculpture and so on and hope a lot of VIPs will be there and then finish it in the next year or two. So yes, I have um, a, a big commitment to the commemorations in Normandy. It's always been moving to see how many young people are now drawn into the commemorations and really want to understand yeah, what the issues great. were, what the values were, you know, why people sacrifice what they did. And I think that's why we need a British memorial in Normandy. Well, this will be the last big celebration where you know veterans will still be alive as correct, well. So correct. And I they think, are still there and they are wonderful. Yeah. And they are determined to be there on the sixth of June this year. Yes. So then into the Lords in twenty sixteen as a cross bench peer. Uh, are you enjoying that new challenge? It's different. Uh -huh. um, it's quite reassuring at my age to join an institution where people say, it's so nice to see a fresh young face. <laughs> That's good for the morale. It's a place that takes a little time to get to know the yeah. codes, a lot of unwritten codes, a lot of incredibly distinguished, experienced, wise people in every walk of life. And although it's, you know, it can be easily mocked, um, if you go to a debate in the Lords on any subject, you will find some of the real subject specialists in the country. Uh, and so we can have debates, we can look at legislation coming from the House of Commons without that very, very sort of partisan, uh, febrile atmosphere down the corridor in the Commons. And I think the Lords does really good work in yeah. improving draft legislation and in debating some of the big issues and writing reports. And if people want to look um, for Lords committee reports, they will find, you know, careful, thought out, factual uh, reports on many, many different subjects which are not biased one way or the other, but which give people the basic facts. So I think the place does good work. Mm -hmm. I'm now on a couple of the committees, uh, but it does it in a rather low key way. Yeah, yeah. So, and then just looking at your current portfolio, it's a nice mix of private sector and charitable work. Uh, you're pretty happy with that right now? Yes, I, I, people like me often take on a portfolio of things, which is what I've done. And I was warned before I retired that unless you're careful, the pro bono yeah. charitable work will dominate everything else you do. And that has proved to be the case, but that's all right. I enjoy that. I, I do some teaching. Mm -hmm. I very much enjoy my interaction with the, uh, the students, um, uh, with uh, think tanks like Rusi. And I now have the chance to think a bit about the theory of what I did in practice, right. like national security, which, right. I mean, we set up the National Security Council without really thinking about right. deeply, you know, what is national right. security? Um, now I'm doing a bit of that thinking, which I'm enjoying very much. Well, we're hoping you're going to write something for us on that. Uh, we were just publishing uh, Robert Hannigan's uh, paper on the establishment of the National Cybersecurity Center, the NCSC. Yes. It'd be great to to delve more into the National Security Council and thoughts. And you and I and, and Malcolm have been discussing that and what, what, you know, what could be done today to potentially make it better, uh, et cetera. So that would be yes. fantastic. Okay, your very last question, because I know we're running out of time. We could talk forever. There's still so much to talk about. But one way we end this podcast is advice you have for uh, younger people today who are thinking about going into a career, foreign policy, security policy. Uh, if you reflect back on all the amazing things that you've done, yeah, uh, would you recommend the Foreign Office? Would you go back and do the BBC? <laughs> if you could do it again, would you do something entirely different, like tech or the private sector? Uh, what's a good? What's a uh, would be good training for a career in foreign and security policy? I mean, I think you probably have to make a decision early on what motivates you. Do you want to make a lot of money, or are you interested in public policy? And in my 40 years, I never had a job that wasn't interesting and challenging um, and with dealing with, with material that was important in its own way. And I think if that's what gets you going, then the, there are far worse careers than in the Foreign Service. Um, in the British Civil Service now, you can join one department like the Foreign Office, then you can move to others if you prefer to. Um, and you can move out and take time to go to a think tank or private sector and then come back. So it's a very flexible career. It's a very satisfying career. And I think if young people are thinking about diplomacy as a career, get out there, get some experience internationally, go and work for a year abroad, um, show your passion and your commitment to an international life that will help when you come to choose diplomacy. And then when you get into the career, go for it. Uh, I don't think I ever said no to a job. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they were a bit scary and uh, I wondered whether I should, you know, could do that. I never said no. I think if you don't say no and you take on what's offered to you, you will find you thoroughly enjoy your career. Okay, so you don't regret not going to the BBC? I don't regret. I mean, I love I love the BBC. I think to get a 40-year career of the kind I've had in the Foreign Office would be quite difficult. In right, the BBC. right. 
Wonderful. Well, uh, many thanks to the Right Honourable, the Lord Ricketts. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Karen. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. This podcast was produced by Tom Ascott, developed by Caroline Tranter, with further research from Neil Watling. Keep up to date with the latest defence and security analysis by visiting www.rusi.org.